Delighted to be joined today by Narina Hertz. Narina, how are you? I'm very well, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Delighted to see you as always. So listen, kind of, we've got the book, we've got the book on screen, The Lonely Century. Obviously, unbelievably timely. How has the pandemic exacerbated everything you started talking about? So even before the pandemic, this was actually the lonely century with yeah. one in 10 millennials saying that they didn't have a single friend at all with three in five 16 to 24 s saying that they felt lonely always or often, with two in five pensioners saying that they, their main form of company was a pet and 40% of office workers globally feeling lonely. So even before the pandemic, we knew that there was a problem. Of course, the pandemic has massively accelerated and exacerbated this. And, and it matters, it matters for our health. Loneliness isn't just bad for our physical health, as we might expect. So we know that loneliness makes people feel more anxious, more depressed, um, and at the extreme, more likely to commit suicide. Um, it's also bad for our physical health, which is something that, when I was researching the subject, you know, it was not immediately apparent. So it turns out loneliness is as bad for our physical health smoking 15 cigarettes a day so it matters which is quite incredible so yeah. it matters it matters to our health but it also matters to our economy and um and i know that for um the audience viewing this may be um particularly of interest um it matters for two reasons first because of course it's a drain on public health budgets but also because of its impact on productivity and turnover mm. and engagement amongst workforce. We know that lonely workers are less productive, less motivated, more likely to quit a company than workers who aren't. We know that people who don't have a good friend at work are six times less likely to feel engaged than um, workers who do have a friend at work. So we know that there's actually a bottom line ramification and then it also affects the economy because it affects our politics too. And one of the fascinating um, dimensions of my research was the link that I established between the rise of extremist politics across the globe. So the rise of populism over the past few years and the growing loneliness mm -hmm. crisis. So in terms of political stability, uh, loneliness is an issue that needs to be addressed as well. It threatens our very democracy. Obviously, you did an immense amount of research with it for the book. Can you share a couple of things which surprised you or really grasped your attention during, while you're doing the research? As I was researching the book, you know, I'm an academic, and so there's a you know, lot of um, data and um, empirical research there. But I also crisscrossed the globe, meeting um, people who felt lonely, but also seeing manifestations of what I have called the loneliness economy. Mm. So the entire market made up of goods and services designed to alleviate loneliness and deliver connection. You know, some of these are more familiar to us. So um, co-working spaces, co-living spaces, uh, social robots, uh, tech, enabled devices that help people come together, platforms like Meetup or Pinterest. So there's a whole ecosystem of businesses essentially um, designed to deliver connection and community. But at the extremes, I also um, experienced firsthand some of the more extreme offerings. In fact, when I was in Manhattan, I rented a friend. This is before the pandemic, but um, just a few months before the pandemic, we rented Brittany um, for a few hours. We wandered around downtown Manhattan. We drank matcha tea together. We went to a bookstore and we tried on hats. And, um, you know, obviously, Nick, it wasn't like being with an old friend, but, you know, when you meet someone new and you're kind of vibing with them, um, well, that's what it felt like. Afterwards, of course, I reflected upon the fact that she probably was laughing at all my jokes because I was paying her for yeah. <laughs> but, um, but Not at all, really. I'm sure they're very funny. Absolutely. But there are 600,000 friends for rent 
on the website where I rented Britney. So, uh, and to be clear, it was um, platonic. You know, there's nothing untoward about it, which was my worry when I when I did it. So, you know, that was just one of the um, kind of fascinating um, things that I encountered as I really tried to unpack you know, how we got here, mm. and importantly, what we need to do about it. I suppose as we go into the next phase of the pandemic, and especially for kind of for a business working concept, the, the conversation is all around remote working versus office-based working and kind of, as you say, it's very polarised kind of, as seems to be everything in society. What are your thoughts, opinions, kind of ideas around where we go? I think from a business perspective, almost the starting point needs to be a recognition of the massive latent demand now for connection and community amongst their workforce, but also with regards to one's customers and customer base. Um, when we're looking at the workforce, one thing that is surprising to people is that the loneliest generation are actually the post-millennials. So if you think about your younger hires, your 18 to um, 26, 27 year olds, these are actually the loneliest generation. So for them, a feeling of connection and community is really, really important. Now, trying to deliver that um, out of the office is, as companies across the globe have realized over this past uh, year or so, a real challenge. And, mm -hmm. and it is a real challenge. And you know, whilst there have been kind of numerous hacks that companies have had to come up with, um, I think we've all come away realizing that when it comes to developing and um, nurturing the social glue that's actually really important within organizations, you know, those, um, ha those tidbits that you'd share at the um, water cooler, not only about what you did at the weekend, but about, um, oh, did you know that so-and-so, this client of ours, um, is looking for X, Y, Z. So those kind of actually really important exchanges that happen informally uh, haven't been happening mm. over Zoom and actually can't really happen in this sort of format. So for me, I think companies need to recognize that they do need to be at least some days a week in the office moving mm. forward. And what my research has found that um, you really want your employees ideally to be in the office on the same day because it's not you know it's not much use if somebody's coming in on monday and someone else on wednesday yeah. and they never meet um but just having people physically in a space together isn't doesn't necessarily deliver connection and community and in fact um one of the counterintuitive things my research uncovered was that open plan offices mm -hmm. are actually really um not good spaces for delivering face-to-face -face interaction and then open plan spaces people are actually more likely to send messages to each other on their from their phones or their computers rather than speak um, and that the conversations are thereby shallower so they're <laughs> fascinating so it's about how do you get staff to actually do things together face to face when they're in the office. Of course, this is all predicated on people feeling safe. Mm. You know, that's a given to this whole conversation. Um, so, and there are some really actually quite easy uh, steps that companies can take that have proven results in, in this regard. One is encouraging and facilitating staff um, so that they can eat together. Mm. fascinating research done in Chicago with firefighters and the researchers found that companies of firefighters who ate together didn't only feel more bonded but they actually performed twice as well um, company taking breaks at the same time Bank of America did a uh, did a pilot project in one of their call center operations where they got um, staff to take their breaks at the same time. Again, they found really significant uptake, not only in how connected people felt, but also in terms of performance and deliverables. Volunteering together. That's another well-proven way to get staff to feel bonded 
but also pays off in terms of engagement mm. and satisfaction. But I think companies, you know, could do well by taking this even a step further because um, feeling connected isn't only about doing things together. It's also about creating within your organization a culture in which people want to help each other, in which people want to facilitate each other, in which people are being kind to each other. And this may sound a bit kind of airy fairy, but um, global tech company Cisco is actually an exemplar of this because at Cisco, they have a scheme whereby anyone up or down the organization can nominate anyone else. So it could be the receptionist nominating a manager or vice versa, um, who's been particularly kind or helpful. And that person can get a cash reward of up to $10,000. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that a company that so explicitly values and incentivizes kindness and collaboration and helpfulness has also been voted for the fourth year in a row, the best company in the world to work for. Mm by its employees and also has turnover half the industry average. So just a few things okay. for businesses to think about, but so much more um, that companies can do, so many things that companies can do once they realize that community and connection actually delivers in a material sense to their business. Let me just step away from the lowest entry for one last question, I suppose. In your books over, over time, you've covered debt, loneliness, decision-making, capitalism, and it's, made, it's always been major trends in global timelines. Explain to us how you identify and cultivate those thought-leading trends and how kind of you latch onto something in order to think this is where I'm going to focus. That's a great question. So the way I look at the world and I figure out where we're heading, and, you know, as you say, with a um, pretty good track record, having absolutely global debt crisis before, before it happens, and now kind of recognizing the um, imperative we have to deal with loneliness, but also in earlier work, the um, kind of back, predicting the backlash against globalization, the rise of um, ESG investment, et cetera. Um, the way I do it is I piece together um, a jigsaw puzzle where I suddenly I can see the picture. And it's a kind of research strategy that I honed first in my PhD when I um, looked at, made what my PhD was um, essentially looking at what kind of economy was going to emerge in Russia after, um, after 1991 um, when um, the Soviet Union collapsed. And so it was a research process which I honed then when I was spending a lot of time in factories across Russia. Um, and then developing um, saw from that, that what was going to emerge in Russia was never going to be um, the Western style capitalism, which economists at the time thought was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Further honed with my work in the Middle East, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Israel and Palestine, when I worked um, with various governments, but also local institutions and bodies there. And, um, you know, came up with a pretty accurate trajectory of where um, Middle East would um, evolve in terms of peace process, but also um, the importance economic ties would ultimately have in rejoining the region as we've seen um, in, in recent times. So it's, it's, it's a process that I'm um, well practiced in. And then of course I layer on top of that you know, just a very, very rigorous research mind. So on top of that, I'll be reading, mm. you know, the kind of academic articles you don't want to read, but you want me to read. So they, uh, <laughs> you so do the I hard graph for translate us. Translate them for you. So at the same time, layering that. So it's, it's an iterative process. It mixes real world um, examples, real world insights with the best and the most cutting edge academic research. And so far, um, so far, it's really helped me make sense of what already was a complex world and what inevitably will just be even more complex moving forward. Irina Hertz, thank you so much indeed for your time today. And as always, it's been a fascinating conversation and look forward to catching up again soon.
Thank you, Nick. Thank you.